Good morning, church. We are continuing in our series on relationship killers. In this series, we are looking at the things in our lives, our characters, our attitude, which kills relationships. One thing that truly affects relationship is fatigue. Now, I'm not talking about relationship fatigue. You're getting tired of relationship, no. But I'm talking about physical and mental fatigue. You know, when you are spent physically, when you're worn out physically, and you're just tired and exhausted, or when you're worn out mentally, and that you're just stressed or depressed. Let's be very honest. When we are exhausted, whether physically or mentally, we ain't interested in relationships. We ain't interested in maintaining relationships, in behaving our best. In fact, when we are tired, we easily get depressed, we easily get angry, we easily get irritated. Things which people not do, which normally don't really bother us, and we can let it go, when we are tired and exhausted, it becomes a problem. It irritates us more. It affects us more. Now, the problem is this. It's okay to be tired and stressed once in a while. If you get tired once a year and you just take a good rest, you recover, it's okay. It doesn't affect much. But when you are getting fatigued regularly, maybe three out of five days, you're feeling tired and stressed. Maybe three out of five days, you're always exhausted. It becomes a problem for relationships because we can't maintain healthy relationships when we are always tired or stressed. You see, tiredness and stress affects our bodies in ways we never realize. For example, before the 1980s, doctors have always realized that stomach ulcer has always been related to stress. And that was mainstream medical gospel at the time, that when people have stomach ulcer, they always try to treat the stress that those people are facing. But somewhere after in the 1980, some Australian scientists discovered that stomach ulcer was caused by a certain type of bacteria that was found in the stomach. And suddenly, doctors were so happy because now it's no longer a stress problem. All they need to do is just give patients a pill and they can take it and kill the bacteria. A couple of years later, the doctors discovered that this bacteria that is causing stomach ulcer was actually present in two-thirds of the world's population. But only a small percentage of them have stomach ulcers. And, later, and what they discovered was this, is that when people are stressed, what happens is that your immune system shuts down. And when your immune system shuts down, your body is not able to repair the stomach lining that is eaten away by the bacteria and thus you cause stomach ulcer. And so what that, that research discovered was this, is that stress truly causes stomach ulcer. Why am I telling you this? Well, if stress can make our bodies vulnerable to diseases and to bacteria, what more can it do to other areas in our lives? It will affect other areas in our lives because when we are stressed and tired, our immune system goes down, our perseverance goes down, our patience goes down. And even though the bacteria is always there, we are not able to withstand it. Similarly, in relationships, the relationships, tensions and cracks were always there. But because we are tired and stressed, we were not able to withstand it. We are not able to face it. Our spirit, spirits can no longer tolerate those differences, those issues. And because of that, we hurt relationships. Why? Would you write the first point of your notes is this. Is that we are spiritually vulnerable when we are physically and mentally tired. We are physical, spiritually vulnerable when we are physically and mentally tired. You see, the devil knows that you are at your weakest when you are physically and mentally exhausted. 
That's the time when he will tempt you. That's the time when he will bring things that will tempt you to break relationships. Let me give you an example. The story is told of David and Absalom. Absalom was his son, and his son overthrew the father David. And David was on the run. He, he escaped and he was on the run. And this is what the Bible does in 2 Samuel. He says this, when Absalom was asking his advisors how to deal with David, this is what it says in verse 1. Moreover, Atihopel said to Absalom, Now, let me choose 12,000 men, and I will arise and pursue David tonight. I will come upon him while he is weary and weak, and make him afraid, and all the people who are with him will flee, and I will strike only the king. You see, what, what Antihopel was advising Absalom was this. You know, this is the right time because David is weary and weak. He is tired. He is exhausted. This is the best time to strike him. And the Bible said that that was the best advice. But we praise God that he actually thwarted that advice and David was, man, was spared from being massacred. Otherwise, you won't have the rest of the story of David in the Bible. Another example in the Bible is this. It's Elijah. The passage that was read in our scripture reading this morning. You know, Elijah was a prophet. The Bible tells us how he defeated the prophets of Baal. He challenged 1,000 prophets and he challenged them. He was one man challenging 1,000 prophets and he managed to uh, defeat all of them. And he was, a, he was spiritually very high. But after that, he was exhausted. And because he was exhausted and Jezebel, queen of Israel at the time, came and challenged Elijah. She wanted to kill Elijah. And what happened? This man who just defeated a thousand prophets single-handedly ran for his life. He was afraid and he ran for his life. Why? Why was it earlier on he was so strong he could face a thousand prophets and now suddenly one woman wanted to kill him? He ran for his life because Elijah was exhausted physically and mentally. And because of that, he too became spiritually vulnerable. Let me read to you what happened in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 1. It says, And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. You see, Elijah just left his servant there. You see, friends, when you are completely exhausted and when you are spent, you don't want to be in relationships. You don't have anything to do with relationships. And so Elijah just left his servant there and he just, just left him and he went on. Verse 4, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree and he prayed that he might die. You see, Elijah was so exhausted. He was so tired. He was so fed up. He was basically gave up on life and was telling God, Lord, just take me home. I want to die. Just get, get, let, me, let me die. And verse 5, Then as he lay and slept under a broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said, Arise and eat. Notice that the first thing that God does to Elijah, when Elijah was seeking God for help, the first thing that God did, he didn't give him a spiritual answer. He didn't talk to him about spiritual matters. The first thing that God asked Elijah was, get up and eat. You need to eat. Verse 6, then he looked, and there by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. So he ate and drank, and lay down again. See how exhausted Elijah was? After eating and drinking, he go back to sleep again. And then verse 7, And the angel of the Lord came back a second time, touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for you. Then he eat again. You see, he was so exhausted, eat, wake up, sleep, wake up, eat again. And verse 8, So he arose and ate and drank, and he went in the strength of that food. 40 days and 40 nights. You see how strong he is now after he has been recharged, after he has been re-energized. Re he went in the food 40 days and 40 nights as far as Horeb, the mountain of God, 
And there he went into a cave and spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. You see, friends, God couldn't deal with Elijah's spirit earlier on. God couldn't speak to him. God couldn't minister to Elijah. Why? Because he was physically and mentally exhausted. And God knew God had to deal with that first. God had to recharge his energy. God had to recharge his physical and mental strength before God can sit down and deal with his spirit. And so the same for us. If we want to have a spiritual strength to deal with relationships, we too need to ensure that we, our physical and mental strength is optimum, that we are functional, functioning optimally physically and mentally. In fact, would you write your next point? I know this. To maintain healthy relationships, we need to be physically and mentally recharged. To maintain healthy relationships, we need to be physically and mentally recharged most of the time. Maybe not 100% all the time, but at least 90% of the time, 95% of the time, we need to be physically and mentally recharged. And how do we do that? Well, number one, would you write in your notes? Adequate sleep. It's just simple as that. Let's go back to 1 Kings 19. It says this, verse 5. Then Elijah, as he lay and slept under a broom tree, the first thing Elijah needed was to sleep. Friends, sometimes for some of us here, we just lack sleep. We, just, we, are just not, we are not in an optimum condition for relationships when we don't have enough sleep. I mean, let's be very frank. When are you more easily irritable? Is it in the morning when you have slept and woke up? Or is it at the end of the day when you are tired and lack of sleep? When are you more irritable? You know, when, when I'm lack of sleep, I don't want to talk to my children. They, they just make a bit of noise, it irritates me. Why? Because I'm lack of sleep. How do you know if you have a good night's sleep? You know, I know like doctors say you need to have seven hours, hours, eight hours. You know, but you know how, how do I know when I have a good night's sleep? When I have, good, when I have enough sleep? Very simple. When you wake up in the morning, do you feel tired or refreshed? When you wake up in the morning, do you need the alarm clock to wake you up or do you wake up because you are fresh? When you wake up in the morning, do you drag your feet off of bed? That will tell you if you have enough sleep or not. Let's continue, verse 8. So he arose and ate and drank. The second thing we need to, to recharge our energy is simple. A healthy diet. A healthy diet. You know, friends, this is the rule of thumb for a healthy diet. What tastes good is bad. What tastes bad is good. Isn't that true? Many times in life, you know, just, 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 I just go by that rule. If something tastes good, most likely it's bad for your health. If whatever tastes bad, chances are it's good for your health. And you know, we live in a world today that is just full of fast food, carbonated drinks. It's like everything we eat is either too salty, too sweet, too fat. And we need to learn to eat healthier. And I mean, it doesn't mean that we can't enjoy good food. We can. But we need to have a good and healthy diet. And then first, and verse 8. So he arose and ate and drank. And he went in that strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights. Whoa. After that, Elijah could walk and travel for 40 days and 40 nights. Friends, you know what's the third thing we need? We should write in your notes. Regular exercise. 40 days of exercise. Regular exercise. You know, studies have shown that when people who exercise, they think better, they are more concentrated, and they live longer. Okay, I do not know how true all this is. But one thing I do know is that we, in today's age, we need to exercise. And for me, I struggle with that. I struggle with that, but I know that this is something that we need to exercise. We need to maintain a healthy lifestyle. And for that, for many of us, in order to maintain a healthy lifestyle, so that we are always physically and mentally refreshed for relationships, many of us, there are things in our lives that we need to change. To maintain a healthy diet, a regular exercise, and enough sleep, there are things in our lives that need to change. In fact, would you write the next point of your notes is this, if needed, change your lifestyle. Change your lifestyle. You know, for some of us, we just need to consciously and intentionally change certain habits in our life because those habits are detrimental to our physical and mental well-being and as a consequence, it affects our relationships. 
You see, I, I used to don't bother about health, you know. I mean, when I was growing up, especially in my younger days, you know, I usually don't bother about health. In fact, I used to tell Christians that food is one of the things that we Christians can still enjoy. Other things in all the other uh, quote-unquote sinful pleasures we cannot, but food is something we can still enjoy. And one day, I was convicted with this verse in 1 Corinthians 6, 19. It says this, Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Spirit who is in you? whom you have from God, and you are not your own. For you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. In other words, what Paul is saying in, Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians is this, is that our body doesn't belong to us. And that if we are to be good stewards, we also need to steward this body. We also need to take care of this body because this, this body belongs to God, not us. So as much as we take care of us for not committing sin, as much as we guard ourselves to we steward our money, we steward our ministry, we steward our family, we also need to steward this body that the Lord has given us. And to fail to steward this body is no less than sin itself. In fact, I think the church today, we are, you know, we are equally as guilty of the sin of obesity and not just sin of adultery and unforgiveness, but we are just as guilty of the sin of obesity and uh, neglecting this body. Rick Warren, the famous author of A Purpose Driven Life, he, made, he said this statement, he said this, The Father made your body, Jesus paid for your body. The Spirit lives in your body. You better take care of it. And in fact, that's what he did. He, he, he was sharing his story was this. In 2011, Rick Warren was baptizing uh, members in his church. They had something like, you know, a few, about 100 over baptisms. And he was baptizing people. And after a while, you know, they were doing by immersion. So they were dipping them in the water and picking them up. And after a while, Rick realized that, you know, his hand was getting so tired. And he looked at all the people he was baptizing, he realized that, hey, we've got a lot of fat people in the church. Because they're, 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 they're all just so overweight and it's just so heavy to lift them up in the water and up again. But you see, the problem for Rick was this. He couldn't say anything to his members because he too was overweight. He was about, you know, he was, he was grossly overweight. And because of that, he began a program in the church where he got the entire church to come along to change their lifestyle, to change their eating habits, and he called it the Daniel Plan. And they actually came together as a church to watch their health, to improve. And for Rick Warren himself, in the first year, he lost 50 pounds. And, you know, and, and, and his life would just got much healthier. And in a consequence, so does relationships. For some of us today, it may not just be our eating habits that need a lifestyle change. For some of us, we are getting tired and stressed over maybe because of work, because of ministry. Maybe we're getting tired and stressed over our hobbies or earning, earning money. And for some of us, you know, maybe we just need to make a lifestyle change. If the job that we have is causing too much exhaustion in our lives, perhaps we need to change the job, the job that we have. If because we are looking, we are seeking for a higher pay or we are seeking for a certain uh, affluence in life, but it's causing us too much exhaustion physically and mentally, perhaps that is what we are required to change in our lifestyle. It may mean you get a lesser pay. It may get, mean you get a lesser uh, job which have, have a lousier image in your eye. But whatever it is, there are certain lifestyle changes that we need so that we don't continue being exhausted physically and mentally. You see, friends, if these things that are keeping us tired, exhausted, keeping us fatigued, and if we just continue to hold on to it, what we are actually saying is this, is that this job or this career or this food or this eating habit, whatever it is, what we are saying is that this thing is more important than relationships. Even though it's affecting my well-being in maintaining good relationships, I'm not willing to let it go. Means that is more important 
than relationships. Another thing we need to realize, to stop fatigue from killing our relationships, would you write the next point of your notes is this, intentionally schedule energy into your relationships. What do I mean by that? You see, friends, we schedule a lot of things in our day. You know, in, in our day, you know, for most of us who, are, who have a busy day, busy schedule, we schedule a lot of things. We schedule work, we schedule appointments, we schedule errands. But how many of us actually schedule relationships into our day? And when I say schedule, I don't mean scheduling based on time. No, but energy. You see, very often, we can schedule in time for our family but we don't schedule in energy for them. So by the time we come home to our family, we are already zoned out, we are already exhausted, we are already blanked out, we no longer have time, energy for them. So although we have time for them, but we are just sitting at the sofa completely tired and all we want to do is just watch TV because we are just so tired, we are just so zoned out. Isn't that true? We come back from a hard day of work and we can come back early, although it's just 5 o'clock, we can still come back at 5 o'clock. But because we are just so exhausted mentally and physically at work, when we come home, we have no energy left for our family. Husbands, you know, your home is not a place for you to run away from work. It's not a place for you to just go back and recharge because your home is where your family is and you need energy for them. Wives, your children are not everything. Don't, you, you, you don't spend all your energy on taking care of your children and dealing with your children's problems. By the time your husband comes home, you have zero energy left for him. We need to learn to schedule energy into our relationships. We need to learn to put energy into it. You know, friends, for myself, I've learned to realize that I only have a limited amount of energy a day. And that's why sometimes in a day, when, certain pe when people want to come to see me, whether it be the office staff or sometimes church member, and so sometimes, although I have time to see them, but I will sit, still choose not to because I know that if I were to spend that time, I would also exhaust the energy that I have remained. And then by the time I go home, there will be no energy left. And so in such cases, although I may have time, what I would need to do is I would tell them, you know, we have to reschedule, I'll see you another day, I'll see you another time, so that I do not deplete all my energy in the day, in the office, so that, and that by the time I go home, there is still energy at home. And that's what I mean by intentionally scheduling energy for relationships. And so friends, we need to intentionally schedule in energy for the relationships in our life. We need to learn to reserve energy for the relationships around us. Well, brothers and sisters in Christ, as we continue in this series about relationship killers, let's not just remember, focus on the spiritual matters, but let's not forget that equally, our physical and mental well-being also affects relationship. But as we now learn to guard our physical and mental health and to guard our physical and mental well-being, you will find that relationships get better. Why? Is it because people around you are getting better? No. But because I am getting more prepared. Like the immune system in our body, we are getting more rested, we are getting more uh, rested physically and mentally, our immune system is rising. Then although the same relationships are around us, the same bacteria, the same frictions are all around us, but yet we are getting stronger and we are getting better prepared. But if we are always tired and stressed and we are always drained out of energy physically and mentally, that if, that, then our immune system goes down. Our tolerance for friction in relationships goes down then even the slightest sneeze around us will cause us to fall sick. The slightest sneeze will cause a break in relationships. And so friends, may I encourage you this morning. For those of us, if you are living a life and you find yourself drained physically and mentally most of the time, 
that you, do, that you don't have energy left for relationships, may I encourage you, make that lifestyle change. Don't wait, but make that lifestyle change today. Let us pray. Wonderful Jesus, wonderful Saviour, mighty God. Lord, I just want to commit my brothers and sisters unto your hands. As we go through this series, looking, reflecting on the relationships in our lives, help us, Lord, not to neglect our physical and mental well-being. Because it is out of that that we find the ability, the tenacity to deal with frictions in relationships. Lord, may you give my brothers and sisters a commitment to change the lifestyle, the areas in their lifestyle that needs to be changed so that they will always have a physical and men they will live a physical and mentally optimum life so that they are always prepared for whatever relationship hurdles that come their way. Lord, I just commit my brothers and sisters, wherever they are in the homes, Lord, may you watch over them. In Jesus' name we pray.